Something's happening. All right, excellent. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today is September 22nd, and uh, welcome to St. Joseph Healthcare Hamilton Medical Grand Rounds for today. Go to the next slide. And we'll go to the next slide. Um, and uh, as we always do, we will start with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton sits on the traditional territories of the Mississaugas and the Haudenosaunee nations and is within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. This is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. And on that note, I'll, I'll point out as many of us are aware, uh, this upcoming um, week, September 30th is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, uh, otherwise referred to as Orange Shirt Day, uh, a special opportunity for us to reflect on all the work uh, that lays ahead in terms of Indigenous reconciliation. Next slide, please. And uh, with that, uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Manali Mukherjee, uh, who will be presenting today on post-acute COVID sequelae, the aftermath of COVID-19. And uh, together with Dr. Mukherjee, we're delighted to have Dr. Bo Don Bodish, who's the Executive Director of the Firestone Institute for Respiratory Health. And uh, she's here to co-host with me today. And I'm gonna hand things over to Dr. Bodish for uh, a more formal introduction of Dr. Mukherjee. Thanks, Dr. Bodish. Thanks so much for this opportunity. It's one of my great joys to work with colleagues like Dr. Mukherjee. As uh, for those of you who haven't had the pleasure of meeting her, she's an assistant professor in the Firestone Institute for Respiratory Health and the Division of Respirology. Uh, she has a peripatetic uh, accent coming from her uh, various stints all over uh, India and the UK. She did her degree in India. Her master's then was done at the University of Dundee. She moved and did a PhD, very successful PhD at the University of Nottingham, and uh, then went to work at uh, in Singapore on and where she got an interest in lung autoimmunity. So fortunately, our own Dr. Pram Nair had the good sense to recruit her here as a postdoc, where she was incredibly successful in building a program on lung autoimmunity in the context of asthma. Now, as she was building this incredible research program, um, she was, we were fortunate enough to be able to recruit her as a assistant professor. And I don't believe in luck in science, but I do believe that chance favors the prepared mind. So Dr. Mukherjee was really instrumental in understanding very quickly that the type of infection caused by uh, COVID-19 uh, could be something that could be exacerbated or indeed triggered autoimmune responses. And in that context, she was one of the really early researchers to recognize that uh, long COVID was going to be a substantive problem and it was going to have a sort of an immune basis to it. So in recognition of this, she's actually been invited to participate and be a thought uh, leader in Canada's long COVID strategic plan. Um, she's a recognized expert in the post-COVID condition. In fact, she's uh, been called upon by media experts uh, to help explain this to the general public. And she's had extensive funding in the past few years through the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, uh, the COVID Immunity Task Force. And uh, as of today, she published a very important paper in the European Respiratory Journal, uh, really highlighting some of the data that she's going to show you. And uh, when I looked at my email at 8 a.m. this morning, apparently it's already been, uh, this press release has already been syndicated by several dozen newspapers. So I think this is going to be a really transformative uh, insight into uh, the sort of causes of this condition, but ultimately the treatments. And so it gives me huge pleasure to introduce our shining star, Dr. Manali Mukherjee. 
Thank you, Don. That was extremely, extremely kind of you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so as my um, title slide suggests, I will be speaking to you about uh, post-acute COVID sequelae or long COVID and uh, as an aftermath of COVID-19 with a particular interest on my area of expertise, which is autoimmunity. So um, here are my disclosures and my biggest disclaimer is the fact that I am myself have a personal history of long COVID that's been persistent for 20 months now and I am recovering. So that's my disclaimer. Right. So I'd like to start with this slide because this kind of captures where we are today. Um, as of September 2022, more than 600 million uh, people all over uh, the world has been infected with COVID-19 and more than 95% have recovered. In Canada itself, um, I read a news report last week which says coast to coast, we are looking at 60% of the Canadian population who have already been infected. And if we look at the World Health Organization estimates, it's about 10% of those who survived the infection will possibly end up having persistent symptoms. And if we pro project that to how many Canadians have been infected, we're looking at something north of 300,000 when it comes to dealing with post-COVID conditions. Definitions are very important. So as of today, the WHO clinical case definition for post-COVID-19 condition stands as thus, that it occurs in uh, individuals with a history of probable or confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection, usually three months from the onset of COVID-19 with symptoms and the symptoms that last for at least two months thereafter and which cannot be explained by an alternative diagnosis. The common symptoms include fatigue, shortness of breath, cognitive dysfunction, but also others and generally have an impact on everyday functioning. Symptoms may be new onset following initial recovery from an acute COVID-19 episode or persist from an initial disease. Symptoms may also fluctuate or relapse over time. This is one of the earliest um, systematic reviews that showed the different symptoms and the constellation of symptoms associated with post COVID, uh, with post COVID-19 condition or long COVID. Um, fatigue being the most common one reported, headaches, attention disorder, dyspnea, chest pain or discomfort, cough, joint pains and other inflammatory rashes, etc. And when the study looked at the symptoms and what was reported, almost 80% um, of the symptoms were associated with an increased inflammatory um, mediator signal uh, and or an abnormal chest X-ray or a, a abnormal CT uh, finding. So without further uh, going on about the symptoms, because I think we are all dealing with it, I wanted to look at what might be uh, underlying these uh, long COVID symptoms. And this was my initial understanding when we started the project when much was not known and the WHO definition was quite a shortened one, not the extensive one, which I just read out. So the immunological underpinnings of long COVID long COVID, in my opinion, is very much embedded in, in the severity uh, of the acute phase itself, because the acute phase of the uh, disease had these three cardinal features of lymphopenia, extensive neutrophil activation and netosis, and increased uh, inflammation with cytokine storm release and uh, evidence of circulating autoantibodies. So when there is um, in lymphopenia, netosis, delayed resolution of inflammation, preceding uh, a, a recovery. There are three possible scenarios and that this is how I'm trying to look at it and trying to um, you know, dissect it. So the COVID itself could trigger hyperinflammation, inf which can lead to uh, autoantibodies that was developed during the acute phase that keeps on persisting and therefore maybe adds to long COVID symptoms. There could be molecular mimicry where during COVID or post-COVID, uh, there are autoantibodies that uh, were generated that recognizes some viral epitopes, which further ends up resembling or recognizing some self epitopes. This could also be a part of novel autoantigens that may be formed because of uh, the infection itself. And it could be also due to residual virus. The, so molecular mimicry can be one of the possibilities. And the next possibility that I looked at and which, which is, um, 
quite the question that is often asked is whether COVID triggered some subclinical autoimmune disease. So there could be an increase in incidence of diagnosed autoimmune disease. So you could have um, been at risk or uh, you possibly had some subclinical issue which and COVID just kind of pushed you over, um, over the pen. So, like the constellation symptoms that are associated with COVID, there is a constellation of um, autoantibodies um, that have already been reported as case reports or um, small uh, studies, um, either cross-sectional small sample size anecdotal evidence uh, over the past uh, one and a half, two years. Uh, autoantibodies, um, um, like, ranging from ANCA to various anti-nuclear, extra-nuclear antibodies to uh, Nexins to uh, ACPA to, to Rho to Heparin, you just name it, there's a constellation of autoantibodies and associated with it, there are a number of uh, known uh, autoimmune diseases that have been again reported, anecdotal evidence, some case reports, case series showing that they were associated with SARS-CoV-2 during the acute phase of the infection and some developing post uh, the infection during recovery. And, and uh, so far these uh, symptoms and case reports that were um, uh, reported uh, could be anywhere from those who have recovered from the disease or those who were hospitalized or those who required um, uh, ICU uh, care. So looking at um, what is right now there, where we are with the literature, when it comes to uh, long COVID and understanding the underlying immunology, I'd like to highlight this paper, which came on early this year uh, from US. Um, this study was um, looking at about uh, 300 COVID-19 patients, tracking them from their acute disease to about four months post disease. And they found that there are um, pre-existing conditions like type 2 diabetes, the viral load itself, and some viral load with some pre-existing viral diseases like CMV and Epstein-Barr virus, and autoantibodies that could uh, predict uh, those who would develop uh, persisting symptoms uh, of long COVID at about three or four months post uh, the acute infection. And I like to show this little heat map, which shows that about 67% of the uh, post-acute um, symptoms could be explained by um, autoantibodies and, and all the ones that are um, listed here falls within the anti-nuclear extractable nuclear panel. The next study that I'd like to highlight is from Zurich from the group of Onur Boyman, who showed about um, 100 patient follow-up at six months had ANA or anti-nuclear antibody staining pattern uh, seen on uh, HEP2 slides, which is the gold standard for uh, rheumatological assessment of uh, ANAs. Uh, I have put the little um, ICAP consensus, which is an internationally con uh, confirmed and recognized uh, consensus for uh, for, for recognizing the patterns associated with ANAs. And what this study showed that there were uh, about uh, 30 to 40% of patients who showed ANA reactivity. Um, and most of them were associated with the AC4 pattern. And in about uh, 92 who had a follow-up, there was, again, the same AC4, AC4 pattern that came up and some with the AC5 or AC4-like pattern. And these patterns are usually associated with antibodies uh, to, to SS, uh, SSA and SSBLA antigens and uh, RNP self antigens. So our hypothesis uh, was do persistence of specific autoantibodies over 12 months associated with persistence of symptoms and a possible diagnosis of long COVID. So towards this goal, we recruited about 162 um, uh, patients um, between uh, three hospitals, uh, our own site here at St. Joe's, uh, led by um, Dr. Swenningston, Dr. Ho. We got a lot of um, control population uh, with the existing studies that were ongoing by, led by Dr. Bodish and Dr. Nazi. And we partnered with uh, UBC under the leadership of Dr. Colston and Dr. Ryerson, who had a biobank already looking at uh, post-COVID and post-discharge uh, patients. So what we ended up doing is um, getting 106 post-COVID uh, patients. And when I said post-COVID, it means anybody who had a PCR po positive um, infection um, and uh, they were recruited at uh, one to three months post their infection, irrespective of whether they had symptoms or not. And uh, we had, uh, we recruited 22 healthy controls um, 
pre-vaccination, non-COVID, no respiratory symptoms, um, uh, age and sex matched with the three-month post-COVID patients, and about 34 uh, people with post-recovery from an infection. So they had symptoms around the same time, but they tested negative on the PCR. And uh, if we, and then there, thereafter, we uh, did a longitudinal follow-up of the COVID, uh, post-COVID cohort um, for three, six, and 12 months. Yes, we had an attrition about um, by 50% at 12 months, possibly because uh, most patients did get better. So we will talk more about that. The strict exclusion criteria was uh, to make sure that we do not recruit any patient with pre-existing autoimmune disease, malignancy, or chronic infections, and all, all patients were adults. So the very first thing was merit to hypothesis, where the first 36 convalescent patients who were uh, who were um, recruited and who consented to send their uh, samples over to U.S. to University of Texas Southern, uh, like Southern Western, so UTSW under the leadership of Dr. Kwan San Lee, to look at 102 common autoantigens and reactivity compared to 22 of our um, healthy donors, and setting the bar quite high where we looked at the median plus three standard deviations. So each and every red dot is those are those uh, samples that lighted up above that very high cutoff. And there seemed to be um, some autoreactivity uh, in, in these uh, 36 convalescent COVID-19 patients um, post three months recovery. We looked at the IGM and the IGA profile and there was not much there. So we uh, started looking at the auto IgG profile. So when I take this um, data, these uh, microarray data, and I put it into numbers and graphs, the way it's plotted here, we have taken the, mic uh, the frequency of patients who had um, zero reactivities, at least one reactivity or two or more reactivity. We see that um, healthies end up with uh, almost very less autoreactivities. And post-COVID patients have a significant amount of circulating autoantibodies, two or more at three months post-recovery. Thereafter, when I um, this is the same data that is plotted on a histogram. This essentially shows that what are the different um, auto reactivities that are popping up here on this microarray, and uh, there seems to be a number of them that fall within the ANA ENA uh, panel. And when we look at the reactivities between those that are the nuclear antigens versus, versus those that are extra nuclear or more associated with connective tissues um, like a, and, and other receptors like ACE2 or TPO or GAT65, there was a very strong correlation between the nuclear antigens and the, uh, and the other ones that popped up on this microarray. So um, with, with this um, background and with this uh, initial data set, we went ahead and designed our, um, our study where uh, we assessed for specific um, 18 uh, anti-nuclear and extra-nuclear antigens on this line amino assay um, uh, strip. So this is a line amino assay strip that is uh, of a rapid assessment format. It is, uh, it has been, uh, it is widely used and uh, clinically, uh, it has clinical license in Europe and many developing countries, unfortunately, unfortunately not in North America. So it was done under research. The uh, strips uh, were further um, validated in my lab and, and, and cross-validated with the ICAP patterns on the HEP2 uh, slides. And uh, in, in, instead, of doing it sem instead of doing it qualitatively, we uh, adapted the quantitative score where any um, quantitative score above one was considered to be a positive reactivity at one is 200 titer. Next, we looked at um, the cytokines in the stira, and we used uh, we stuck to two main platforms. One was the cytokine storm panel, which is IL-6, IL-8, IL-1, beta, and TNF-alpha. And the second one was the coagulation panel, D-dimer, ICAM-1, VCAM-1, and E-selectin. These um, assays were run on um, a machine called ELA. It's an automated ELISA reader uh, through Protein Simple, and that uses the R&D systems antibodies. Um, Ella came quite uh, a lot in the picture during the COVID times, uh, widely used by Mount Sinai, and it had the emergency clinical use certificate uh, during uh, the acute phase of COVID. What it essentially does is it um, uses a microfluidic channel and uh, looks at um, the reactivity within it, the glass nanotube reactors. It's very reliable. You get uh, data um, that is reproducible from day to day, and it's, it's, it's a multi-analyte format. 
So if we now look at the results, I'll first show the results um, at, at a three month recovery time point. So each and every line amino acid strip um, was uh, has been now uh, put into a heat map format. So let me explain the heat map to you. So every row is an individual donor and every column is a self-reactivity to the specific autoantigen on the line amino acid. Whenever we have zero, it means there was zero reactivity. Anything that is dark, which means there is some reactivity, but it is below um, the, uh, the NQV cutoff. And um, the colors here, uh, going from an intensity of yellow to red, shows the intensity of reactivity um, on, on, the, on, the, on the line amino acids, the int intensity of the bands. So um, the healthy controls here out of 22, there are some reactivities we do know, and we do recognize that 10 to 20% of the normal healthy population can have circulating autoantibodies, and we do see some. Here is the um, heat map for the non-COVID um, infection group where about 34 patients were looked at and there were again, some circulating autoantibodies and reactivities that popped up here. And here is our first post-COVID uh, patient group segregated based on the fact that they recovered at home. And then we, now we start seeing there's some little bit more um, uh, of reactivities pop, popping up on this um, heat map. When we further look at the post-COVID hospitalized uh, patients uh, who were not in the ICU versus those in the ICU, we can see quite a lot of reactivities. And this is at three months post-recovery. So you can um, essentially look at the three uh, subgroups of uh, post-COVID patients stratified by their uh, acute phase severity. When I take these numbers and I plot it, so the way I've plotted it is, on the y-axis, you have the number of ANA reactivities per individual. And on the x-axis, we have the subgroups. We see that in general, there is an increased amount of autoreactivities post-recovery in those who recovered from COVID compared to an infection control or healthy. It's the same uh, thing that I've plotted here, but in a, dif in a different format. Here I've looked, I've shown you the histograms of frequencies and literally uh, patients who have post-COVID infections, there are more number of patients who have three, four, five, six, or almost up to nine autoreactivities in their serum, which just shows a huge transient increase in autoreactivities as a, as a point of um, possibly dealing with the infection itself. Um, but we all know that the body goes towards um, homeostasis and uh, post-infection, there's always a transient increase in autoantibodies and then there is resolution. Indeed, when we look at, the, at these patients longitudinally, we do see there is a, a significant attenuation. So what this graph shows you, again, I've plotted the frequency of patients who have zero to one to greater than two autoreactivities based on the MQV, the mean quantitative value on the lime amino assays. And as you can see, the blue is the 12 month, um, my uh, index is not showing up. So um, black is the three month recovery, orange is the six month recovery and blue is the 12 month recovery. And by the time you come to 12 months, there is a significant decrease in the number of uh, circulating autoantibodies on general. So now when I look at these further stratified based on the specific autoreactivities, you can see the profiles are quite changing across the landscape from three to 12 months. So initially we had a number of patients who were quite uh, reactive on these uh, line amino assays, but by the time we come to 12 months, um, there are three specific autoantibodies, UNSNRNP, SSPLA, and PMSCL, that are above the 20% cutoff here of, uh, of patients who are having these autoantibodies at 12 months. So um, I, I've plotted these, um, these spaghetti graphs here that, uh, so that you can appreciate that there are a number of patients who actually get better. So they're, 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 um, their titers go down and there are a number of them that stays um, positive and quite uh, high, high band intensities um, at 12 months. So what, what does this all mean? So one of the things that we did right away is are these autoreactivities that are persisting from the acute phase of the infection or are there any de novo um, generation? So one of the things that, um, one of the analysis that we did was we took patients, we looked at patients who did not have a positive autoreactivity at three months and then 
ended up getting positive artery activity at six or uh, six months or 12 months. And we see about 12% of patients showing those de novo generation of autoantibodies. The next one, when we looked at was how do these autoantibodies um, associated, associate with symptoms? Because if we look very closely and if we really, really try hard, we will be able to find um, circulating autoantibodies even in those who are asymptomatic. So unless they uh, associate with clinical manifestation or symptoms at least, um, they, they, the, the authenticity or, or the real um, clinical um, translatability of this data falls quite short. So we got excited at this stage when we started associating with the three most common uh, long COVID symptoms, one, fatigue, second, cough, and third, dyspnea. And we did, uh, um, the forest plots are given here, and the odds ratio clearly show that the two specific autoantibodies, again, SSBLA and RNP, um, predict um, those patients who report fatigue and dyspnea at 12 months. If I further go and do a Z stack of the scores and put them into a heat map, um, you can see that at six months, it seems like there are some autoantibodies that are still predicting the symptoms, but at 12 months, the anti-US UNS and RNP and the SSBLA still keep um, predicting fatigue, and the SSBLA UN and RNS and autoantibodies still keep fit, uh, predicting uh, response. And this association is, I just wanted to say that the way we looked at fatigue is based on the fatigue assessment score, and anybody who had a score of 22 and above uh, was considered to have fatigue. So this is um, a clinically uh, validated questionnaire, and dyspnea was based on the modified MRC score. Anybody had an MRC score of two or more was considered to have uh, dyspnea or shortness of breath. When we further put this um, in, into an ROC uh, curve, an ROC analysis, the area under the curve for the two autoantibodies to predict these symptoms are about 86%, with, um, with, uh, with the specificity of 92% and sensitivity of 70% for predicting fatigue. Now to come to the inflammatory. So is there a residual inflammation that is associated with the presence of these autoantibodies and, and the symptoms? So what we did here is we did a principal component analysis and we plotted the ellipsoids here based on the 95% confidence interval. The blue ellipsoid takes all the asymptomatic uh, individuals and yellow ellipsoid takes all the symptomatic um, individuals. And at three months, we do not see much separation of these ellipsoids based on the inflammatory mediators. At six months, we start seeing some separation, but still not significant. What we start seeing at 12 months is that um, the, there is significant, um, significant movement of these two ellipsoids on the axis. And uh, these uh, separation is, is, is purely driven by uh, TNF alpha, IL-1 beta, and D dimer that remains higher in those who are symptomatic at 12 months. So again, a quick uh, forest plot odds ratio shows that it's TNF alpha that remains higher in these patients at 12 months, and that's what's associated uh, with the fatigue as a, as a symptom, not cough and dyspnea, but fatigue in these patients. So quick uh, look at um, the sex ratio and, and considering the fact that women or female are more prone to autoimmune diseases. And there is more and more evidence coming out that female uh, is, women are more prone to getting long COVID. The study was not designed for um, male and female, but we ended up um, recruiting 45% uh, uh, women in the study. So when we quickly have a look at the autoreactivities, there is no difference between male and female over the uh, one year. But when we look at the symptoms, it seems like at 12 months, the, the, the ones who identify themselves as female have, uh, have more symptomatic uh, disease compared to male who, have, uh, who, who uh, have more asymptomatic features here. And in particular, dyspnea seems to be more prevalent in females, at least in our study. So the summary of the study thus far, 80% of convalescent COVID-19 patients, irrespective of long COVID diagnosis at the time of the recruitment, have two or more circulating autoreactivities at three or six months. And there is significant attenuation at 12 months. So if we look at the mean average data, there is significant attenuation. However, 
anti-UNS, SNRNP, SSPLA, and PMSCLA3 autoantibodies that were observed at 12 months, prevalent to up to 30% of post-COVID patients. The two specific ones, RNP and SSPLA, seem to be positive predictors of fatigue and dyspnea on, uh, in, in these convalescent patients at 12 months post-recovery. Of the uh, inflammatory mediators that were uh, analyzed, TNF-alpha was associated with uh, the common long COVID symptoms, particularly fatigue. So we came to this uh, understanding that the incomplete, incomplete attenuation of some of these nuclear anti, uh, uh, autoantibodies um, 12 months post-COVID is associated with persisting symptoms of fatigue and dyspnea and a residual inflammation highlighted by TNF-alpha. And therefore it warrants that we look uh, into the, possible, uh, the possibility of rheumatological complications in long COVID patients. And I must, must acknowledge the major limitation of the study is the lack of neurocognitive symptoms in the analysis because at this time when the study was started with patients being recruited from August 20, 20, 2020, um, uh, the, the three main symptoms that were really being um, collected uh, were, were fatigue, a cough, and, and, and dyspnea. So now moving forward, where are we at now and how are we progressing? We currently have a study ongoing where we have hypothesized that in a subset of confirmed long COVID patients without any pre-COVID rheumatological complications or diagnosis, the pathogenic autoantibodies that persist may develop into autoimmune disease. And the study, um, short form as IPACS, is ongoing. And here are my uh, two co-lead investigators, Dr. Costa Stelios from the Department of Rheumatology, who is the attending rheumatologist on the study and sees every patient at every visit. And Dr. Sarah Swenningson, who is an assistant professor at the Division of uh, Respirology, who is looking at the lung physiology component with a particular interest uh, in, in imaging these patients. So the primary outcome of the study is the prevalence of autoantibodies against the common self-antigens. Um, we are also looking at the airway component, considering uh, the fact that I have a particular expertise in understanding and looking at airway, compartmentalized airway autoimmunity in the lungs. And uh, thereafter to look at a prevalence of clinical diagnosis of rheumatological com uh, complications over time. The way we are doing the study is we are, we are recruiting patients from the community in patient outpatient referrals, self-referrals from patients and support groups. We are screening them for their PCR uh, reports with the confirm confirmation of um, COVID via serology. We are making sure that they do not have a previous history of rheumatological uh, disorders, malignancy as well. Um, they, they are recruited in their first visit where they, they are looked for, uh, they, they, they're um, investigated, a number of investigations are done. We are doing a very, very uh, clear, clear uh, characterization of their clinical symptoms, as well as um, uh, sputum induction, um, all sorts of lung function tests, CT, and Dr. Stelios is looking at the whole rheumatology panel and assessing them with including a, a physical assessment. And then we are seeing these patients back at six and 12 months. Um, the current the study is currently recruiting, and all thanks to my study coordinator, Snehal, who's doing a phenomenal job right now. We have screened about 217 patients from about 400 referrals that we have received. We have recruited at the as of today, 82 patients who have finished their visit once with complete rheumatological uh, assessments. Um, any of these patients who have a respirology component is being looked at by Dr. Terence Ho. Um, 16 of them have finished their visit too. Uh, the first patient was recruited in September 2021, and the first patient diagnosed by Dr. Stelios having a, a, a rheumatological complication was in December 2021. And I will, um, in, this, um, in this talk, with showing you that patient uh, patient case study. This was a 51 year old male who presented to us. Um, the BMI was 29.7, he was a never smoker. He came to us 16 months post COVID. He was previously healthy. He had a PCR confirmation of COVID and this was prior to being vaccinated. He had recovered at home, but he was quite symptomatic during his acute phase. Uh, at six months when he presented to us, he reported aches, fatigues, diarrhea, chest pains, low pressure, loss of movement, so swollen joints. His PFT was normal, his CT is normal, his CBC was normal, so his, he did not have lymphopenia. His sputum differentials were normal, showing that there was no airway inflammation. His six minute uh, walk test post dyspnea showed a high, uh, high work scale and fatigue. 
He has an uh, unremarkable family history of uh, autoimmune or cancer. Um, Dr. Costas uh, ordered for some clinical investigations and he was ANA positive. During our investigations in the lab as a part of the IPAC study, we did a rheumatoid panel, which um, did not cut the mustard, so it was negative. But on the ANA panel, again, we see the two UNS and RNP and um, SSBLA that came up. We further followed this up with a titer on the HEP2 on the HEP2 uh, immunofluorescent slide, and he was positive for up to one is to one is to uh, 320 titer. Uh, his TNF and IL8 was high, and his normal and his immunoglobulin levels were normal. At 18 months post COVID, um, he was diagnosed with the uh, PMR and a possible trajectory to lupus. Dr. Stelio started him uh, at his uh, clinical discretion on Plaquenil. Um, and his current assessment, he has had his two visits. His fatigue assessment score, which was 37 at visit one, um, improved to 33 at visit two, which is a point of four. That is the MCID for fatigue assessment score. So there was a clinically uh, significant improvement. And, and, and currently his last, his visit happened last month, which is 28. So from 37 to 28, there has been a significant improvement in his uh, fatigue symptoms and other, um, other uh, questionnaires like SGRQ and uh, other quality of life questionnaires. There has been a significant decrease in ANA titers and TNF alpha, but he's still ANA positive. His symptoms are better managed, but as um, Dr. Stelios, who's the attending rheumatologist, has confirmed, he still has active disease. So I'm going to leave you at that, showing the fact that um, presence of autoantibodies uh, at 12 months uh, may need some follow-up, and uh, our rheumatology colleagues um, uh, may, may need to be involved uh, in their care to see if there is any possible trajectory. There is always this hope that by 24 months, most of these patients will again uh, attenuate and they, they will uh, recover. So massive acknowledgments uh, to my team, uh, Dr. Kiyo San and Ramin, Ramin Jamil, who did a majority of this work, uh, along with uh, the collaborators at the University of British Columbia. At McMaster, we have a massive team. It's a village and have, I have got immense support from uh, each one of them uh, that's listed out here, starting from Dr. Naya's lab, from Dr. Swenningson's lab, from Dr. Nazi's lab, from Dr. Baudish's lab, clinicians, Dr. Stelios, Dr. Wasserman, Dr. Khalidi, and Dr. St uh, Dr. Lashia has been extremely supportive uh, with this study as well. Um, and uh, the data analysis was um, spearheaded uh, and helped by Dr. Balakrishnan from the, from the Department of Statistics and Anna Dorfin uh, gave up. So I, I will leave you with that and uh, I'm, I'm happy to take any question and I'm looking forward um, to, the, to the discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Mukherjee, for uh, a fascinating look into all of the incredible research that you and your teams have been doing on this uh, highly um, applicable topic uh, to all of our lives. I think just, uh, you know, even the sheer show of, of numbers of folks who are joining in to, to taking your presentation today. Uh, just highlights how applicable this topic is across the board, across all of the specialties uh, that we that we practice within the Department of Medicine. Um, so thank you again for that. Um, we'll now enter into the Q&A portion. And Dr. Mukherjee, as we were chatting before we logged on, said that she intentionally was wanting to leave sufficient time for a lot of dialogue to get input uh, from, from uh, clinical colleagues and, and of course beyond. Uh, so I will start. I see there are two questions in the Q&A, one in the chat and a hand raise. So I'm going to go in the order that things came through and start with the two questions in the Q&A, if that's okay. Uh, and, and Dr. Bodish is here both as co-moderator, but also as co-expert, I think. Um, so uh, Don, feel free to jump in at any point. I'll just kind of be the reader uh, of the question. So first question from Dr. Herzl Gerstein. Excellent. To what extent does vaccination reduce the likelihood of long COVID or autoimmunity? Um, that is a fantastic question. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gerstein. Um, this study had, uh, mostly had, a, like we captured patients who got COVID uh, before they got vaccinated. But the current study uh, that is ongoing, the IPAC study, we are collecting um, data and we are getting patients who who um, 
who have a long COVID diagnosis, despite uh, being vaccinated with even uh, two doses and more. Um, so right now the data is not there, so I cannot give you a long shot answer here, but we are seeing long COVID patients uh, despite the fact they were vaccinated. There is, however, a, a paper that was uh, published uh, about two months back that showed that vaccination does reduce the chances of uh, getting a, a long COVID diagnosis, but uh, we, I do not have the data, so that's all I can answer right now. I can, I can jump in there too. So Canada doesn't have good monitoring for long COVID, so we don't have good estimates, but if we look at the UK, uh, Israel or places that are doing real-time monitoring, the estimate it's about a 50% reduction, which is not as consoling as one would like. And the other thing that I think is really important to communicate is there's no evidence that having been infected and escaping long COVID provides any protection against acquiring long COVID in a, neck, the, a reinfection. So um, the high, hybrid immunity that one gets from having had an infection in the context of vaccination doesn't seem to be sufficient, at least in the countries that have published these data to date, to protect or reduce that long COVID risk. So if you're vaccinated, you get a 50% reduction, but having been infected doesn't improve that, doesn't provide any extra protection. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you for that. Um, so then we've got, uh, apologies if there's any lack of clarity, just if there are any further questions, feel free to put them in the question and answer section rather than the chat. Some folks plugging them in both sides. Uh, so one question here from Dr. Greg Kernu. We know that patients who have influenza, pneumococcal pneumonia, symptomatic shingles infections post COVID have a higher rate of MIs in the next year. Do you think certain infection processes should be considered risk factors for future vascular events? And if so, how do we enter these into our thinking process and prevention? There's a, this is a long one, I'll keep on reading. I hope you can see it too, so you can refer yeah. to it as you're answering. As you know, there's reasonable evidence that influenza vaccines prevent cardiovascular events in the next few years. How would you share this with patients in a meaningful way? Do you think the COVID vaccines are important for decreasing long COVID syndrome and severity of future vascular events? So kind of building on that last question. Right. So um, that is actually a great question. So the three things that that's floating when it comes to long COVID, one, uh, one is the autoimmune pathology. The second is the cardiovascular and microclots. And the third is the neurocognitive. So um, if you look at it this way, that the vascular events are possibly preceded uh, by uh, microclots. And there was a beautiful study from Europe that showed that post-COVID patients have uh, microclots and that were associated with the, um, the cardiovascular events. I believe there is a study and data coming out from the CanCove study. So it's coming out from UFT showing very similar um, data sets. And um, I, 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 I don't know yet whether uh, this is specific to COVID or not, but I, I can definitely ascertain that if there is that much of high uh, inflammatory events still ongoing, it definitely poses a risk factor uh, to, to uh, cardiovascular events, especially if there are microclots that's happening. So if I look at it in a, in, in, in a immun, immunological perspective, if I look at it from the basic science, uh, we are very much aware from the acute phase of the COVID that the autoantibodies that are persistent or the residual virus that is that can be there can cause tremendous amount of neutrophil activation and atosis, which will lead to endothelial dysfunction. N the nets form scaffolds for platelet aggregation, uh, aggregation, and that can form those microclots. So that can very well form the basis of the cardiovascular events that's being seen. There might be specific autoantibodies too that contribute to uh, ca cardiovascular diseases and myocarditis, but um, right now this study was not in the scope to look, look at that. Um, um, and uh, the last question about um, vaccines, it's, uh, what, it's what uh, we have already been speaking about, and Dr. Bodish said that uh, right now there is not enough evidence, but uh, we, like, you know, we do see patients who are having long COVID syndrome despite vaccines, and uh, it's, we, we have to wait and see how the data comes out regarding if vaccines do reduce the severity of long COVID-associated vascular events. Uh, the point is that if the inflammation keeps on persisting, then there will be associated pathology. And I think it will be from 
individual to individual depending on, on what their individual risk factors are. Excellent, thank you. Uh, going to our next question. Uh, thank you for your beautiful presentation and data. Patients with different severity of disease were included. So this is in reference to your research. Uh, do you have any information on how they were treated during their infection? And if this affects the autoantibody profile they present? Yeah, so the, the data was collected in patients mostly um, post-recovery trials. So they were all on dexamethasone. And uh, we didn't get any patients who were on uh, anti l 6 tosi So all the patients who were, uh, who were recruited in the study, whether it's, it was from here, from Hamilton or from UBC, they were, uh, they were all on uh, the dexamethasone uh, uh, regimen, but not on TOSI. And no, uh, when we look at, uh, when, we, when we look at other, um, other uh, factors, um, at least for the UBC data set, uh, there, there was no, uh, nothing that came up that could say that uh, any kind of anti-inflammatory or IV solimedrol, some patients were on that, that could reduce the persistence of autoantibodies. So at three months, there, there was definitely increased amount. By the time you come to six months to 12 months, you see that, you know, patients who have home recovered, even they have persistence. Uh, those who were in the ICU, even they have persistence. Or those who were in the hospitalized, even they have persistence, w whether they were on dexamethasone or whether they were on nothing, aka the home recovered patients. So I do not think that the anti-inflammatory regimen, at least the dexamethasone regimen at uh, during the acute phase, uh, has has uh, much effect on the development and the persistence of autoantibodies over 12 months. Thank you. Uh, we I, looks like we've got at least three more questions lined up here, so we'll take them in order. Uh, from Dr. Imran Satya, great talk, Manali. And two questions. Uh, number one, do you think this autoimmunity is specific to COVID-19? Is there any evidence from SARS or other viruses that might induce autoimmunity? So maybe we'll take that one first, and then I, we can read out the second. That's a great question. So um, is this autoimmunity specific to COVID-19 for that one particular patient? The answer is possibly yes, because they didn't have any before or they didn't um, complain of a rheumatological complication before. Um, is is uh, autoimmunity specific to COVID-19? I don't think so, because um, post-viral syndromes and uh, development of de novo auto, uh, autoimmunity post-virus, post-bad uh, virus uh, infection is, is uh, well known. For example, uh, cytomegaloviruses, they, they are notorious for, uh, for leading to um, autoimmune diseases like Guillain-Barre syndrome or Miller-Fisher syndrome. Uh, EBV Epstein-Barr virus is associated with a number of uh, uh, rheumatological complications and autoimmune diseases. So, um, you know, uh, viruses can definitely trigger the immune system, confuse the immune system and lead to, uh, lead to development of autoantibodies. And sometimes, when the body cannot um, go back to homeostasis and it, it, the, the autoantibodies persist. So uh, it is something I think that's associated with the virus per se. For that particular in individual, I think it is most, it is because they got COVID. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There could be predisposing factors like type two diabetes and maybe a previous infection with uh, Epstein-Barr or CMV that can predispose you as per the study that was published in Cell, but we didn't. We do not have the data for this for this study. Thank you. Um, the the second question uh, from Dr. Satya is the autoimmunity in uh, LA slash SRNP related to symptoms of connective tissue disease, joints, dry eyes slash mouth swallowing difficulties. You demonstrated it is associated with fatigue and shortness of breath, but this suggests that the autoimmunity is localized to the lung, your thoughts? So um, I, did I did hypothesize that it, it might be localized to the lung because the infection, the site of infection is uh, like, it it's, it's, the, it's the lung. But so far as the data suggest um, from the IPAC study that is ongoing uh, is that there is uh, not that much significant autoreactivity that's coming up in the, in the uh, in the airway secretion. So we, I've been looking at sputum in those patients 
uh, who can produce uh, sputum on an induction. So we have not been able to see uh, much autoreactivity on our uh, sputum panels. Uh, it seems like it is more long COVID, long COVID associated autoimmunity is more a systemic issue right now. Um, so the SSB LA patients, yes, we are collecting um, the symptoms like joint pains, uh, dry eyes, sicker syndrome, swallowing. We are we are collecting all those symptoms. So if, if like like we we will be able to uh, look at that analysis maybe in a few months time now once we uh, get our first set of V1 the visit one recruitments done. But as I uh, showed in the first case report that the patient uh, did have a number of these symptoms um, and, and, and had a positive uh, SSBLA and a positive RNP. So um, my thoughts into this, I don't think this is a localized area autoimmunity um, that we otherwise see in uh, the complex areas diseases like EGPN, severe asthma. I think the autoimmunity associated with long COVID, despite it having a lung related site of infection is more systemic. Okay, um, excellent. And it looks like uh, Dr. Nair had a similar uh, question. Um, and so I think that's been answered. Are the autoimmune responses specific to SARS-CoV-2? Couldn't any virus trigger autoimmune responses? I don't know if there's anything further yes, you it wanted could. to add Yes, it, it absolutely can. And there is a lot of different, lot of evidence of post-viral syndromes and, and molecular mimicry. I think the problem that we are facing right now is the sheer numbers that has been associated, but that is associated with COVID. And, and that's why it presents with a possible healthcare problem. Okay, great. Uh, looks like we've got four more questions in the Q&A here. Uh, you can take a, catch, your, catch your breath if you need to uh, while I read out. So this is from Dr. Michael Sear. <coughs> this autoantibody pattern seen in any other viral infections? Also, is there a known genetic susceptibility to developing these post-COVID autoantibodies? Um, genetic susceptibility, there, was, there is a study ongoing I know so far it had like nothing confirmed as such. This autoantibody pattern, uh, yes, um, it, it is seen in MC, some mixed connective tissue disease that, that happened post uh, uh, viral, uh, post viral, as a post viral syndrome, and uh, also in some MECFS, so chronic fatigue syndrome patients uh, as well. But uh, like we know that chronic fatigue syndrome shares some autoimmune features, but still does not have a confirmed um, label to be a rheumatological, like to, to be an autoimmune disease. But there are a number of patients who have uh, chronic fatigue syndromes who have similar ANA patterns and, and they can backtrack their, uh, the, the development of their, their symptoms from uh, preceding or uh, viral infections. So yes, the answer is yes. This pattern is seen in other viral infections and also MERS-1, there were some case reports. Thank you so much. Um, and so for our next three questions, I'm gonna hand things over to Dr. Bodish. Dr. Cox would like to know if uh, you can give an estimate of the likelihood of recovery from long COVID, what percent can expect to recover? Because of course he gets asked this very often. Yeah, that, that's a great question. So one thing I want to say that this, this study, the first study, the one which got published, that is um, 106 convalescents, so all comers. Out of that, there's a possibility based on our um, data that 30% um, develop uh, long COVID at 12 months. Um, but we also know that most of them, as per the definition of WHO at six months, who are still having persistent symptoms, may have to, said that, you know, I have long, long COVID. But uh, about 50% of them uh, have attenuated symptoms by, by 12 months. And I do have the 24 month data. So we have analyzed it. E even uh, at the 24 month, there is about, uh, again, 10 to 20% who uh, still have persistent symptoms. Again, these numbers kind of match up with the numbers that we know and that have been thrown around. So uh, at 24 months, it seems a number of patients who were symptomatic at six and 12 months have now attenuated. So in like a short answer to your question, uh, Dr. Cox, is that I think majority, a good 50%, 50 to 60% patients who are who have long COVID symptoms at six months uh, may recover by the time, by, by 
by 12 to 20 months. But there will be a subset, I think it's going to be about 10 to 15 percent who uh, will have symptoms which, which will require medical intervention. And maybe they'll get better in 30 months. I, I don't know. We have to see. We have, we have to see. It's so dynamic, this field. We won't make you predict the future. No, so let I'm you not collect the data. <laughs> Um, the next question is, what about diseases that increased post-COVID um, but are not autoimmune? For example, the type 2 diabetes, although maybe as immunologists, you and I can have a debate about the role of the immune system in that. Um, yeah. Do you have any comments on those diseases? Yes. So um, type 2 diabetes ha does not have a confirmed autoimmune, uh, you know, tag like label, but there is a uh, extensive research going on in, in showing that there is an underlying autoimmune pathology in type 2 diabetes. For example, there can be antibodies against ZN, zinc T8 antibodies in, in type 2 diabetes uh, that's associated with uh, some of the um, some of the clinical manifestations and, 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 the, and the insulin uh, levels. So, um, and um, in fact, there, there can also be receptor antibodies uh, that, that can be present in type 2 diabetes. So um, A, if we don't take into consideration that there is an autoimmune pathology in type 2 diabetes, then yes, there is a predisposing factor that has been shown in the um, cell paper from 2022 from the US that it is a predisposing factor for those for, for those developing into post-COVID syndrome at four months. So I'm still waiting to see more data about that. Um, if you have had uh, um, like type 1 diabetes, there has been a number of case reports showing type 1 diabetes, but we know that that's an autoimmune disease. Um, many metabolic, uh, other metabolic conditions, obesity has also been linked uh, to developing post-COVID uh, symptoms. There has been uh, questions with just normal immunoglobulin levels. So not, not autoantibodies, but um, a uh, dysregulation between IgG and I IgM and IgG3 ratios that can uh, lead uh, that can that are associated with long COVID uh, symptoms and uh, even bronchial asthma. But I I I, I do not um, I I'm skeptical about that data set. So um, yeah. If, if Great. Our it. next question actually um, is one uh, that um, might take more than our remaining four minutes to answer, but in one that you and I are actively studying. So COVID infections have changed. Uh, people aren't as sick as, as previously, but there's a fatigue for future vaccinations and uncertainty of how effective vaccinations are. Can we over-vaccinate people? It is, reasonable, it, is it reasonable for high-risk people to configure vaccinations every six months? And, and our, uh, Dr. Kurnu is confused about how to give advice, especially to lower-risk individuals and advice for future vaccination. I, I have a I bit of a bias here as I'm running. For this. Yeah, I'm, I'm running I'm a very large study to answer all these questions. Question because I have the same, uh, and I do not have data. So hopefully if I have some data from my IPAC study where we are actually extensively uh, collecting those questions as mandated by the COVID immunity task force, hopefully I'll have some answer, but I'll leave it to Dr. Baudish to answer that because I'm completely out of breath for this. The, sh the shortest answer I can give, although as an immunologist, we're, we want to give details, is there's no evidence that you can over-vaccinate. The best advice you, is you could give to your patients is to vaccinate at the beginning of the wave when they're most protected. They only get about six months of protection, and inevitably, our vaccines will become less effective as we select for variants that are not as good. So you should use your clout to lobby for policymakers and politicians to fund things like the inhaled vaccines, which are believed to be far more effective, but are for various complex reasons, not something that um, most of the industries are pursuing. Um, so that's your short answer from an immunologist. All right, but how does the presence of autoantibodies result in the symptoms observed? I think this is a question that a lot of people have. Yeah, that's a great question. So. Um... The simple answer to this is uh, I have not done mechanistic studies yet on this, and obviously that's something that's ongoing, and we would like to get funding to do those mechanistic um, uh, studies. Right now, we have at least come to find two specific autoantibodies, so we can chase uh, those mechanisms. But uh, on a long haul answer, when there are um, when there when there is significant presence of autoantibodies, it it indicates that there is hyperinflammation and your immune system is overworked, so that can just lead to fatigue. And I think the shortness of breath uh, is more to do with 
maybe gas exchange or, or uh, you know, uh, lung physiology. So that's something that Dr. Swenningsen and I are looking at, but we have not yet been able to find a mechanism by which we can um, say how these two specific autoantibodies leads to shortness of breath. Fatigue is an easier answer. So I've already given that. Excellent, thank you. And then for our last um, comment or question, uh, back to Dr. Gerard Cox, our colleagues in rheumatology feared there would be a large increase in new cases, as well as exacerbation of connective tissue diseases, e.g. those historically related to ANA positivity with COVID. This seems not to have happened. Full credit to Dr. Celios and you for documenting new onset of a CTD following COVID, but this has not been seen much, I think, question mark. I don't know if you wanted to end off with any comment toward that. I have actually put a slide on. Here. I have actually put a slide on. Excellent. Dr. Cox, we have we currently this is a slide showing six patients. Uh, this was this is the data that we'll present at the American College of Rheumatology conference, uh, showing six new onset of uh, rheumatological like you know autoimmune disease post COVID. Uh, right now, the number is at ten. So out of the eighty-two patients recruited as of this week, we have 10 uh, confirmed cases of rheumatological complications. Um, the most common that we are seeing are POTS, psoriasis. We have one lupus, PMR. Um, and uh, the POTS, we are further trying to look at specific autoantibodies for POTS now, for example, uh, stalcholine receptors, and we are, we, are, we are increasing our panel. We are further increasing our panel to look at the neurocognitive panel and if there are some neural and autoantibodies, and I'm collaborating uh, down south with Dr. Quanz and Lee on that. So the truth is uh, that there might be more than that's being reported, or maybe patients are not coming forward, or, or the diagnosis is not happening because uh, the titers are low. At one is to 100 titer, I don't think that is considered even positive uh, on the on the bioplex that's done. But these are low titers, and any and but these are positive. This is not one is to 40. This is one is to 100, and some of the patients can have up to almost one is to 320 or one is to 1,000 uh, titers. So uh, we we are working on a case report and a, and a manuscript to get out these 10 patients that we have found from our ongoing IPAC study. Excellent um, additional info there on and and I'll just you know uh, I see we've just just crossed over to 901. Uh, so while I, I have the distinct feeling that we could continue on with uh, a very fascinating conversation and Q&A uh, for much longer, uh, we will wrap things up. And uh, with huge thanks to you, Dr. Mukherjee, and kudos on all of your uh, very successful research and all of the amazing ideas uh, and work you will continue to do in this sphere. Um, thank you also to Dr. Don Bodish, uh, uh, an expert and a collaborator, and also in her role as executive director of the Firestone Institute for Respiratory Health for joining us here today. Uh, we're delighted to have such expertise in the Zoom room here at McMaster. Uh, we're very privileged and, and thanks, thanks to all for participating and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Madeline. Thanks, Don. Bye. <laughs> Take care.